Uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, segmental conditional random fields for speech recognition, which is um, a new way of doing uh, speech recognition. Uh, it's, a, it's a new model that, that we believe is more flexible than, than the current state of the art. Uh, so most of the work was done uh, at Microsoft Research with uh, Jeffrey Tsvai uh, while I was there <coughs> uh, last year. So what I'm going to do is to um, have the talk in three parts. The first part is going to be uh, introducing the introducing uh, speech recognition from the ground up uh, with uh, the view of uh, machine learning using standard machine learning techniques with simple classification techniques uh, to do speech recognition and we call that flat direct models. And then extend that model uh, with a particular of speech uh, which is a structure, the temporal structure of speech that has to be taken into account and that uh, is uh, segmental conditional random fields. And then I'll extend, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show what applications uh, they are of the model. Okay, so the idea um, of linear classification is very simple. You have, uh, you have observation that comes from a sensory input. So in, in that case, you have uh, six images. And uh, what you want to do is uh, to classify these images into uh, emotions, right? So there are six, emo six possible emotions. And so again, you have uh, input X, I give you an image, and you would like to find uh, which is the emotion in the six emotions that is, uh, um, that is of interest. And so <coughs> we call X the input and y, y the output. So if you want to do that with machines, um, the first thing you want to, you want to do is to build uh, what we call a feature vector. So when you have raw sensory input like uh, colored pixels, you want to transform these, these, uh, this input object of you know, these, these pixels into uh, a feature vector that's relevant to your, to your task. And most of the intelligence that we, we spend in, machine, in applied machine learning is to craft a good uh, feature vector that's relevant to the task. So you want to extract uh, numbers that are important to the task. So in instance, if you want to detect uh, happiness, then uh, you want to detect that there's a smile in the, in the bottom half of, of, the, of the image. So you, know, you, you, you can measure uh, how much of the, of the bottom half of the face is covered by the teeth, right? Or uh, what is the curvature of the lips, right? Or, uh, in Western culture, people smile with their mouth, but in, in uh, Asian cultures, they, they tend to smile with their uh, eyes. So you want, you want to measure things about how the uh, eye configuration is. <coughs> uh, and so the, the, the feature vector that you extract, we, it, we call it phi of x, or uh, sometimes we just call it x. And it has a fixed dimension of, uh, of size t. Right? And so what's important is that no matter how the image is configured, it could be a 400 by 200 or a 10,000 by 1,200 uh, uh, pixels, you want to extract a, a feature vector that's always of the same dimension. Okay. And so to do classification now, um, the easiest thing is to draw a linear boundary within this embedding. Right, so in this case, uh, let's imagine that you have only two dimensions. You, you extracted two vectors. And you have objects um, that come into uh, either red or blue. And you want to say which, which ones are the red ones and which ones are the blue ones. So the simplest thing you can, you can do is to just draw, uh, draw a classification boundary, a hyper, hyperplane in this two-dimensional two plane. And say anything that's above it is going to be red, and anything below it is going to be blue. And of course, sometimes you make errors, because the, the model is, is, a, is a bit simple. Uh, and so the, the, the way you draw this, uh, this decision boundary is that you compute a dot product between um, the feature vector and some vector. And then you look at the value of the dot product. 
And if the value of the dot product is positive, it's going to be on this side of the hyperplane. If it's negative, it's going to be on the other side of the hyperplane. And this is why the value of the dot product, we call it uh, the discriminant function. It's, it's good for discriminating, discriminating whether it's a red dot or a blue dot. By the way, if, there, if there's any question, uh, just, just feel free to. Uh, Yes, uh, yes, you can train it with a support. It, it, it can be thought of as a, as a linear support vector machine. And so with a, linear, uh, with a support vector machine, you'd like to increase the margin, uh, to, to have the biggest margin here uh, that you can. With the standard techniques, for instance, you'd, you'd, like, to, uh, you'd like to maximize the, the sum of distances with all points. Uh, so, but yes, with a, with a vector machine, you see that there are many multiple solutions that correspond to the same, multiple uh, lines that are almost, uh, almost the same, that, that will classify the same thing with the same, uh, with the same recognition accuracy. And so uh, with a support vector machine, you would, you would just take the one that maximizes uh, the margin of the points that are closest. So again, you know, you're, uh, the, the point is to compute that dot product. Uh, the phi vector depends on the input. The lambda vector uh, does not depend on the input. It defines the model. And uh, th that, that defines essentially the particular instance of this uh, classifier in the family of linear classifiers. OK, so I'm going to do one last thing, which is uh, to make this uh, a probability. And for it to be a probability, um, it, it needs to be positive and it needs to sum over one over the output space. Right? And so the way I do this is I'm just going to exponentiate the discriminant, fu discriminant function and I'm going to call it the potential function. And for it to sum, and so that, that's going to make it uh, between zero and infinity. And um, to make it to sum to one, I'm just going to sum over all possible outcomes so that this, uh, if I sum over, I will get one. Uh, and so there's nothing magic about it. Uh, you know, we call it probability, I mean, it's a probability me measure, uh, but it's not really, uh, uh, it, it's, it's an arbitrary transformation and there's no, uh, there's no, uh, nothing in the problem that dictates that, uh, that we should do that. However, uh, it's convenient because um, there's a large body of literature uh, associated with probability measures, and we can we can use both the intuition and uh, all of the mathematical machinery that, that comes with it. Uh, and finally, um, it actually doesn't change anything in the classification. If uh, if you were doing the classification using uh, the pi function, the discriminative function, you, can, you will have the same classification uh, in the probability sense, right? So if, if a possible outcome y prime, uh, y dominates another possible outcome y prime uh, under pi, it will also dominate uh, y prime under p. Uh, but that is very convenient for us uh, to have this uh, probabilistic view. Okay, uh, so how do we uh, use those um, for speech recognition, right? So in speech, of course, we don't have images or emotions. We, we want to do something else. Uh, so let's apply it uh, to this problem. So there are about 25... Um, million businesses in the US that are registered in, in yellow pages. And um, imagine that uh, you want to build an application where you would speak to your phone, and the phone will recognize which business you are interested in going to. Uh, so, um, so let's say Starbucks, you would say Starbucks, and so it will record a waveform of, uh, of what you said, and it will, tr it will try to pick uh, Starbucks as the as the correct outcome. So uh, among, the, among the, the different tasks that we have in speech, we, we, we classify it as a large vocabulary because um, 
there are many ways of, uh, of having a business name, so that's the, the vocabulary is large, and 25 million is, is relatively large. Um, but it's, uh, it's short. Uh, so there's only two, you know, it's, it's only maybe four seconds, up to four to 10 seconds, and typically two, two or three words maximum. Yeah, and that, that has implication in, in the computational uh, things we can do uh, with, these, uh, with, with this method. So the way you would want to tackle this problem, if you remember, is that you have to craft a vector phi of y given x uh, that represents the audio uh, in a way that's useful for, for, for uh, doing classification. So your goal is to somehow measure the consistency of uh, what you hear from the audio with respect to the candidate hypothesis that you have, which is Starbucks, right? So in other words, uh, if, you, if you have this, this, this waveform, uh, you need to come up with a number that says, you know, is that, is that indicative of uh, Starbucks or something else? Okay, so one idea, for, uh, the, the first idea that comes to mind maybe is uh, using duration, right? So if the, if the waveform has 20 seconds, it's unlikely that, um, that you would speak a single word, Starbucks, in 20 seconds. It's, it's a little too long. Uh, similarly, if it's, uh, if it's a tenth of a second, it's too short for you to be able to say Starbucks. So it, it's, you know, that, that will indicate that it's inconsistent with the hypothesis being Starbucks. Okay, another idea uh, that was in, in, the, in the early, uh, uh, probably early 80s, uh, is to use a, a library of templates, which is uh, a library of sounds that other people have uh, recorded of the word Starbucks itself, and so if you go if you go in your library and match it to your waveform, and you have it for you know all of the all of the words that say Starbucks, all of the words that say Home Depot, and you find the closest one, the, the one that is closest, then you would say um, the the correct recognition is the one that corresponds to the closest label. So it's it's a nearest neighbor approach. Okay. Uh, and so you can, you, you can do this, um, you know, for instance, zero crossing rate as people used to do. And you can do this for a while. And after a while, you, you sort of run out of idea because it's, it's kind of a, it's a hard problem to solve cognitively. It's, it's very hard to go directly from the waveform to, uh, to the candidate hypothesis. So one trick that we're going to use, the first trick that we're going to use is uh, to break down the problem so that we can tackle it a little easier. So we break, down, uh, we break it down with a Markov chain, essentially, into two sub-problems. And, and the idea of the Markov chain is that you break this problem into uh, two, two problems, one from, going to, from uh, going to the waveform into the syllable, and into a syllable space, and one from syllables to Starbucks, uh, to, uh, sorry, the, the output space. Uh, and um, you can, you, what, what you decide is that you can solve these two problems independently, right? So when you, when you try to go from the waveform to the syllables, you don't care about the outcome, the word level outcome. And when you go from the syllables to uh, the word, you decide to forget completely uh, what was in the waveform. So the syllables become sufficient statistics for you to figure out uh, what the outcome is. Okay, so far so good. Okay, um, and so that's that's a mark of change because there's a conditional independence between here and there. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now that you've broken the, the problem into problems, you still have to find uh, what features are appropriate. Uh, so imagine you know I've I've listened to an audio waveform and I gave you. Uh, what I thought were the syllables uh, that were spoken within that waveform. Uh, and it, it, it is centuries. And what, uh, what you're asking me is whether century is the correct hypothesis, right? Was, was century spoken or something else? So I need to find a feature vector that will, uh, that will relate uh, this to this. 
<coughs> and so remember that the idea is to of the features is to measure some form of consistency between um, the syllables, we call them detections, um, and the output. Right? So we're going to define three kinds of uh, features, uh, existing features, expectation features, and Levenstein features, and they differ in uh, the amount of information that we use uh, to craft them. So the existence features, I'm going to go into more details uh, about them, but basically um, the existence features are the most general features and they learn by association. You don't tell them anything and they will learn. Uh, the expectation features use a pronunciation dictionary. So you have some preconceived idea of how things are supposed to be pronounced and you can, you can inject that knowledge. And the Levenstein features are uh, the same as the expectation features except that you use uh, the order in the sequence to do the matching. So um, existent feature, we call them uh, informally Pavlov features. Um, and uh, they, are, they don't take sequence into order. And they're basically what we call a bag, of, uh, uh, a bag model, because they don't take into, into, order the, uh, into account the order. And so the way it works is that I'm going to see, for each pair that I see, I'm going to record uh, what pair I've seen, right? So if I see the syllable century with uh, the syllable sen with century, I'm going to, I'm going to, to create uh, that as a feature. Right? And I'm going to say, OK, this, this feature has a value of 1. Uh, and I'm going to do, for, uh, to do this for all, uh, all pairs. And then uh, I'm going to train the system. And so if I, if I do it right, um, typically sen uh, will be associated with a positive weight because it, it tends to be positive evidence that uh, century is the correct hypothesis. On the other hand, uh, z uh, isn't because most people don't pronounce uh, century with a z sound in it or z syllable in it. And so it will get a negative weight. Uh, and so these uh, these features, uh, you see that these features there's no there's no prior knowledge of pronunciation, uh, so it requires a lot of data for you to learn pronunciation. Uh, on the other hand, they can learn arbitrary uh, arbitrary pronunciations. Um, okay, so so you you can try to be smarter. Oh, okay, and so because they are so general. Uh, for every new word, uh, every new word is treated differently as far as we are concerned. So there's no sharing of information between century and centuries, although they are very similar words. Uh, and so, so we want to overcome that so that we, we would need less uh, training data. Okay. Um, so expectation features work as follows. Uh, you have century, and, and you have listened to the word century, and, and you know which syllables are supposed to be in century. So you have a list of syllables that are supposed to appear. And you have the syllables that you ha actually have heard from the audio. And you're going to match, uh, essentially, the two. And you're going to say, uh, OK, century is a match, and re is a match. right? Uh, so th those are good things because you know you're supposed to match as many as many as you can, and then uh, you'll find some that don't match, uh, that are present in the audio but not uh, what's expected in the output, uh, and some that are in the output but are not matched in the audio. Right? So these are these would tend to get a negative weight uh, because they correspond to. Uh, events that, that, that uh, indicate a mismatch between, uh, between the two strings. OK. Um, and then you can, you can introduce sequence. And so you can match those, those two strings as sequences rather than, than just a bag, of, a bag of units. And notice that the difference here is that uh, you can match these two, right? These two and two, you can match them because 
instead of having a bag of frames, you actually know that they correspond, they, they correspond to each other. And so you can record that event as a substitution from two, uh, two whatever. Two. Uh, and so uh, this is more powerful because it allows you to, uh, to do that sequence matching uh, and, and figure out which, which units correspond to each other. All right. So that's the first part of the talk. So to, to summarize, we applied the, the, uh, the concept of linear classification to uh, speech recognition. And we've used that uh, to solve the voice search problem. And so the idea is to extract features from the audio. And you can extract features from the audio uh, uh, directly. Or you can try to break down the problem into two sub-problems. Uh, the, fir the first one being from going from audio to acoustic detections, which are syllables, and then from detections to the output space. Uh, and so we've shown uh, three kinds of possible features that you can, uh, you can uh, derive from, uh, from detections. All right, any questions? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Aha, uh -huh. that's a good question. Um, all right, so, so when you do this classification, right, uh, you, you want to know which, which, weight, which weight goes with this dimension and which weight goes with this dimension. Um, and so the way we do it is you take a lot of training data, right, all of these points, and then um, you try to find the best direction. So the way we do that is we maximize a function which corresponds to the log likelihood of these. Uh, which, is, which is essentially, uh, which is essentially uh, the partition here, mostly. Uh, and so, you know, one way is to do, uh, is to do uh, maximum margin, which is the uh, linear SVM. Uh, what we do is log linear, uh, log, log loss, uh, log likelihood. And uh, the reason for that is that across problems, we've observed that uh, this tends to be a very good uh, proxy for if you proxy for, for whatever objective function. So typically in speech, we like to uh, minimize the word error rate, so the difference in word in the output. Right? So for instance, if I say Starbucks coffee uh, versus uh, Pete's coffee or Home Depot, okay, Home Depot is more wrong than, than, than Pete's coffee. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah uh, I hear you. Um, and in fact, um, so what we do is we essentially have models for each syllable, each syllable and how it's supposed to be spoken. And then we try all possible combination of all syllables and all ways of segmenting them. Uh, and so it, it comes out as a dynamic program uh, that we, we just solve. Is that will actually allow us to detect between all around just detecting this one thing? That's right, that's right. So, so I sort of uh, conveniently glossed over it, uh, but uh, yes. Um, and the reason why I did is, is uh, from the engineering standpoint, basically, this is, this is how the, the uh, classical speech recognitions are, are, are doing. And so we can just use the whole machinery that we have already built to solve that little problem and then go, go on from there. Is there any open source uh, so for this toolkit, yes, there is. You can download one from the Microsoft uh, website. Uh, and for the standard machine, uh, uh, the standard speech recognition, the, there's a number of uh, toolkits available. You can send me an email. Hmm? All right, uh, where were we? Uh, okay, all right. So if you've been paying attention, you, you, you will find that, that uh, it's actually not that convenient. Um, so in the US, there are only 25 million businesses, and, and that's fine, that's, that's not too much to enumerate. So, so to find the best outcome, right, if we use that, that, that framework, we need to enumerate all possible outcomes. 
and say, okay, is that Starbucks? No, that's maybe not Starbucks. Is that Pete's Coffee? Maybe not, it's not Pete's Coffee. And we have to go through all of the 25 million businesses that are in the US uh, to find it. And 25 million is, is, is fine, but it, but it, gets, it can get bigger. Right? And if you, if you, if you look at uh, speech utterance, uh, as the utterance grows larger, then um, you have exponentially many more uh, hypotheses to explore. So that becomes uh, infeasible, and it's depicted here. Basically, um, if you have the number of hypotheses, you can look at the number of hypotheses that you have and how much of the output space you can cover. And so this is, uh, this is query logs from, uh, from, uh, from our voice search, deployed voice search application. And you, you can see basically three, three different ways of sampling and how much, you can, how much of the probability mass you can cover, right? And so you can go up to you know, several millions and you still don't get to 100% uh, 100 coverage. Although this is one of the best cases. Yes? Uh, that's correct. Yes. Uh, that you potentially can get right. So, so. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. I'll repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll repeat the question. I think if I if I get you correctly, you know, what what is the probability mass captured? Uh, what does it mean? And essentially, the number, the number of hypotheses denotes uh, the size of the output space that you can try. Okay? And the probability mass capture means how many, with the size of this output space, can you capture, uh, uh, can you capture from, from what people actually say. Okay? So let's imagine, let's imagine I have just two. I have Facebook and Starbucks. Okay? But you said theoretically capture, not how many will you actually do with it. Uh, so, so, so how many you can capture? And once, once you're able to actually capture them, the question is, do you get them right? I don't understand why you, you, you say how many you can capture. Uh, what is the restriction then on, on that? It's not how many you capture with your model. It's uh, some theoretical restriction? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a re essentially, let, let, let me maybe show, show you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say you only have two. You have Facebook. Um, Facebook and Starbucks, and you know that there are, there's about uh, you know 20% uh, uh, of people who use voice search who are going to ask for Facebook, uh, and maybe another you know 5% that ask for Starbucks, right? So now you've covered 25% of the mass, and anything that says uh, uh, anyone that says anything else, um, you're not going to capture, right? So you 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 can never get it right. Anything, any, uh, uh, but if people say either Facebook or Starbucks, you may get it right or you may not get it right, right? So, so potentially you can go up to, the, the best case is that you, get, get, you can get 25% right. And this is what this, this graph shows. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the language model, from the query log, from the distinct query logs. Can you explain those three Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so, so these are three ways of sampling, of sampling the problem. Right? So, so let's say, let's say you, you, you told me, OK, Patrick, uh, you know, it, it, it takes too much time for you to figure out, to ask these questions, um, whether this is, this is the correct hypothesis or not. Right? So you can only afford a certain number. Right? And that number is the number of hypotheses. Um, and, and so as you increase that number, uh, I, I can get to try more hypotheses, right? Uh, and so, so now the question is, you know, um, how much do I have a chance to get right, right? So, so people, people come, come to the system and ask for different things. And some of them, you know, I will have in the, in the list of hypotheses that I actually know, and some of them, uh, will not be in the list of hypotheses that I actually know. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, if you have, if you have only 100, let's say, um, you can recognize 100 things, right? And so these 100 things, 
uh, covers only 10% of the problem in TMS, which means that 10% of the time, people will say something that I can't understand. And the rest of the 90% of the time, I won't, I won't be able to understand it, no matter how, I try, how hard I try. Uh, and so as you increase that, that, uh, that number, of course, uh, you know, the probability mass goes up. Uh, and the recognition, uh, the recognition rate, uh, the number of things that you can get correct, you actually get correctly, is somewhere in between. Right? Because everything, uh, I don't get everything right that I know about. Right? Uh, yes? Uh, oh yeah, and the three different lines. Um, so 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 now so now the idea is uh, how do you get how would you get that that curve to go you know to go as close as as a as a shape an L shape like that, right? Because uh, because the fewer you few you want to try as few hypotheses as you'd like as you can, right? So that it's cheap, uh, and you want to cover as much as you can. And so the first thing is to say okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, to sample from the query logs, right? So, people people come to uh, come to us, you know, at a billion query a, a month, and I'm just going to to take uh, the top um, the top 100, right? And I'm going to put that in the in the list, right? And then I'm going to ask for more, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and so that's that's the first line. Uh, the second one is to say, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take the top one, but without repeats, right? So if people ask for Facebook twice, I'm just I'm, I'm going to only only take uh, into account one of them. Uh, and the third line is uh, what we call a language model, uh, which is that you have a statistical model. Instead of taking the actual observations, you have a statistical model that um, is a model of how these observations are produced, and you run the model and you say. These are the top strings that, that we believe uh, can be produced from there. And, and, and because it's a, it's, it's a model and, and, and not observation, it generalizes, it tends to generalize better. And this is why you get, you get a little more coverage. Uh, right. Okay. So essentially, the, the, the basic idea here is as the length of the utterance grows, uh, you get exponentially many more hypotheses to try. And you can't try them all if you have you know, 20 words, for instance, in an utterance. And so there needs to be a way for you to, uh, uh, to avoid this, this direction, direct summation of all possible hypotheses. And, and the way we're going to do that is, is that we're going to use the Markov assumption again. Uh, to break down this uh, this summation, and essentially this is the second part of the talk, is we're going to use the special structure of the problem um, to make it simpler, both uh, both computationally and uh, cognitively, for us to solve. And this this is what the segmental conditional random fields are for. Uh, so imagine you 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 want to try to. Uh, to, to uh, compute that function, it's very hard. Uh, it's very hard because you have to try all possible, all possible uh, hypotheses, right? So the hypotheses essentially are, are everything that you can speak. And so if you look at human language, there's, there's any number of, of uh, possible sentences that you can produce. Uh, so the way you do that is you essentially factor the discriminant, the discriminant function into a sum of uh, discriminant functions. And this is the sequence of word, right? And so a sentence is just a sequence of word. And what you're going to do is to break it up word by word so that the sentence uh, just looks at the sum uh, per word of discriminant functions per word. And, uh, and that is how, how you, you're able to break down the problem by uh, by using, um, using the Markov assumption to selectively delete some of the statistical dependencies so that you can uh, tackle the problem more easily. And this is uh, computationally very uh, convenient. And uh, this is the only equation here. I don't, I don't really need to go into the details, but 
visually, I think maybe you can you can you can look at this. If you if you compute the, the probability function, you see that you have uh, the partition function down there that you need to uh, compute, and it's the sum over all possible two-word sentences, two two-word sentences y y prime. Uh, once you do that, once you have that factorization, you're actually able to uh, break this down into uh, two small problems that actually look exactly like this one, right? So instead of enumerating all possible combination of y and y primes, you just enumerate all, possi all, all possible outcomes for y1 and all possible outcomes for y2. And this is how you break it down. It's not, it's not crucial for you to understand, but visually, uh, this is how it works. Uh, you, you, know, you break down the problem. Uh, and, and that's uh, exponential because you have to enumerate everything, and that's just linear. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, any questions? Yes. Yeah, 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 it's the same. Uh, it's a Markov chain, right? So, so essentially, uh, essentially, it's instead of saying that you know, you have to have a function that, a function pi that depends on both y prime and y two, you know, you just break it down into two, and have y one prime and y two prime. And if you think about, uh, uh, if you if you think about the decision process, essentially. Uh, when you, for instance, in y2 prime, or in y2, uh, when you try to figure out which word is spoken uh, as the second word, you essentially forgot uh, what you did for the first word. And this is how you break it down, essentially. And so each word essentially is, is, is considered in, in uh, conditionally independent of the rest of the, of the utterance. OK. Um, so, so now we can structure a problem a little bit. So what's particular about speech, unlike the rest of the classification problems, is that you have structure both on the input and on the output. And the way they relate to each other is unknown, right? So, uh, the input, the audio input, can have different length, right? So it can speak for a long time or a short time, uh, and they can be uh, multiple words. Uh, uh, so they can be two words, three words. You don't know exactly how many words they are, uh, and you also don't know when, how the words related re relate to the audio, right? So when a particular word was spoken. Uh, and so, so that's, that's, that's what you have, input, output, and we're going to introduce a new uh, random variable, which is the segmentation, which assigns, uh, assigns particular segments of time with uh, the output word. Uh, with, and and so, so essentially, you ha because you have, multi you have multiple length in the input, multiple length in the output, you need to match them and see how they align to each other. And, and this is what this, the segmentation does. <coughs> uh, right? So, so um, imagine you have a waveform and you have two words. And so the segmentation essentially cuts in the middle and says, OK, you know, all, everything behind here is the, the word one. Everything after that is uh, the second word. <coughs> and so. Uh, the classical uh, speech recognition uh, systems work with what we call a time synchronous Markov assumption. And essentially, they take this audio and they chop it up into small, uh, small segments every you know, uh, 10 milliseconds. We, sli we have a slice of time. And we decompose the, the, uh, the probability as uh, the potential function, essentially, as uh, the sum of each of these slides of time, okay? And um, 
And if you look at the picture, you will see that if I take the, the slices of time to be too short, uh, then th th there are longer, longer term phenomena that I, I will not be able to capture in any single uh, of these slices. Right? So, so the problem is that uh, the topology of the problem, uh, you know, the nature of the human speech because of, of the uh, articulatory process is a little longer than 10 milliseconds. So I need to look a little, uh, a little further out. Uh, to distinguish uh, these um, trajectories, uh, and this is why this is why the, the slicing it is too is, is too stringent as an assumption, and so the idea is to relax this assumption, and instead go at the word level. So instead of chopping time, we're just going to say, okay, uh, for this whole word, I'm going to match uh, this first word, and I'm just going to build. Uh, a discriminant, a discriminant function that uh, operates at the word level. Okay, uh, this is kind of subtle. I don't know if uh, there are any questions. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So that that's the question. Is so so the the idea is that the segmentation does it for you. And the question is, where does this segmentation come from? Right? Uh, so the segmentation tells you the audio just, just stops here, and that's, that's the first word. And the second word starts here, right? But it, it might as well be you know, here for all I know, right? Uh, and that essentially uh, is, the hid is a hidden variable. You, you don't observe it, right? Uh, and the way we, we go about it is to essentially try all possible segmentations and see which one is the best. Or you know, when we're doing training on expectation, which, where, where the boundary was becomes a, becomes a, a hidden variable that you, we marginalize over. That's right. That's right. All possible, all possible word sequences and all possible ways of these word sequences to segment the audio. Uh, and, and again, that's a dynamic programming, so you cut down from exponential to, uh, because you have a Markov assumption, you, you, can, you cut down from exponential to quadratic in the length of the utterance. Okay, and so the analogy is this one. Uh, you know, segmental models, let's say you, you want to go from some place in Baltimore to some other place in Baltimore. Uh, you would say, you know, uh, take this road and, and, and you can decompose it into, you know, a number of segments, maybe 10 segments. Uh, and, you know, take the highway, leave the highway, uh, and so on and so forth. The analogy is that if you have a, a, a time synchronous uh, matching, you would say, you know, uh, you are here and you have to decide that you have to go forward for another 10 meters. And then you go forward for another 30 feet and you, you have to ask yourself again, you know, is, am I going in the right direction? So you go, you go forward again, and so on and so forth. So it, it's very, very short-term oriented and very myopic uh, way of matching. And this is essentially a fundamental difference. OK. Yes. Yes. In fact, we do we do both. Uh, we do both because um, the way it works is that we have uh, the model that's the, the more general model subsumes the particular model, right? So the model that more relax. Uh, any model that's a hidden Markov model, I can write as a segmental conditional random field, uh, but not the opposite. So what we do is we actually use uh, the small model. Uh, and use use it uh, in the big model, so to speak, uh, and so it becomes a feature. Uh, that 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 might become a little more uh, uh, clear. Uh, in Ten milliseconds, yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, that's right. Uh, and so the segmental condition random fields. Uh, look like this. Uh, you have the words on top, you know, why this is word one, word two, word three, and the observations at the bottom. 
And typically, the observations, rather than be uh, 10 milliseconds frame, we, we use uh, detection outputs like phonemes or syllables. Uh, and the model, essentially, there are three things to know about the model. First of all is that uh, it's a conditional model, which is that it's, it's p of y given x uh, rather than x given y. Uh, and that's important to us because it makes the model uh, discriminative. Okay? And essentially, if you look at the problem you're trying to solve is that you hear audio and you, all, you want to do, all you want to find out is what is uh, the output sequence. If you try to do the opposite, if I give you uh, an output sequence, uh, uh, yes, an, an output word, uh, and you want to generate audio, that's a, syn uh, that's a synthesis problem, right? So, and the synthesis problem is, is much harder. Uh, so, so, so that's a, that, that's why you know it's it's discriminative. Um, the second problem, uh, the, the second property is that it's a log linear model, which means that the features are combined uh, as a simple interpolation, uh, and that is very convenient because it allows you to interpolate uh, between different kind of uh, sources of information of different quality and type. Uh, Yes. HMMs are also the of y given. Yes. Essentially, yeah, yeah. In, in essentially, you have a you have you have a model that says, okay, you know, I give you a word and you produce audio for me. You have an output distribution of words in the HMM word. Oh, this is HMM. this is the opposite. Right. And so. Uh, and so it's great. Uh, it, it, it's it's great for for academia, for instance, because you can explain the world, right? So you you, you have a thought process that, that that tells you, you know, this is this is how sound is generated. Uh, so you know, the air flows through the through the glottis and the vocal tract, and you have you have the mouth and and, and the tongue, and that that creates. A, sounds of a different shape. And so, so that's very convenient because it's a top-down uh, thought process. Uh, however, it's very hard because uh, it's very hard for you to, to model correctly all possible ways of, of, of saying something. Right, right. It's not discriminative. And, and essentially, you're trying to, to make the problem, to solve a, a more general problem. All, all I need to know is what words did you say Starbucks or not Starbucks? That's all, right? So you don't you you solve a smaller problem, and that, that's why it's more effective. So, so how, if they're, if they're turned around, how, how come CRF are in extensions on HMM? That's, that's yeah. Issue. So, so the CRF essentially are the con, you know the conditional random fields are uh, are conditional, right? And and the HMM. The, the HMMs are generative models, right? Um, and so, th so they are different. And the, r the reason, you know, you, you can, here's the thing. The generative models are more general, right? You can, you, can, you can have, for instance, P of O, right? And so you have more information and you can always, sorry, you can always convert a generative model into a uh, conditional model. Yes, yes, but not the opposite, right? So if I have a conditional model, I cannot produce audio. But you, you, you can do it, but it's not computationally feasible. You can theoretically do it, right? You need uh, to integrate audio representation, right? That's right. Yeah, that, it, that's, that's right. How that's right. You would make a, how, that's how you would make HMMs discriminative. That's, that's right. That's, that, that's, that's right. Okay, yeah. Um, yes. And so they are log linear, so you can you can integrate different kinds of information. Uh, so that's very good, and, and we'll come back to that. Uh, the third thing you need to know, and that's the most important thing, is that they're segmental. Uh, so, so instead of having one output observation per word, per output label, you have m a block or segment of observations uh, that you can use to make the determination of the output. And each of these, you can think of flat direct models that we saw in the first section. Okay? So within a word, is completely flat, since you can use all observations. Uh, 
to make the determination of what the word is. OK? Uh, any questions so far? Further questions? Yes? Yes, uh, that's an area I think I think that's related to the question. That's that's an area of uh, research. Uh, technically, you know, technically the so the the framework of li linear classification is very simple, right? And and it, the the way the way you so you solve this is actually the you put complexity in the features, right? And so the features can be arbitrarily complex. And this is how you do nonlinear classification with a linear classifier. You actually uh, have the features be arbitrarily complex. And, and, so, <coughs> and, and so that's the way to do, to do hierarchy. I think I have another question. Exactly. Can, you know, kind of look wherever he wants to look, right? Yes. Yes. So you know, it's a simple, uh, a simple feature I can say is, uh, uh, let's let's say I know that that a particular word cannot be shorter than thirty milliseconds, uh, and cannot be longer than than three hundred milliseconds. You you would be hard pressed to, you can. Uh, but you would be hard pressed to actually do it, do it, do it correctly in, in HNM. Uh, yes. There is a reason you select uh, those words, the language words in the second level of the syllables. Or yes, yes, that's a good question. Um, um, actually, syllables is is a pretty good candidate, uh, and we it's, it's mostly uh, it's mostly arbitrary. Uh, and, and you know some people actually work on syllable and believe that syllable is the right way. Uh, I tend to believe to, to think of words as a, as a sort of unit of, of thought that I can I, you know right. All of all of this is about is how are you able to express you know intuition and knowledge that you have into a feature that that can be used. And and I tend to 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 think of words as as an atomic unit in my head. And, and so I believe that to be more convenient. But but other people may differ. <clears throat> and so here's an example of, of how you use this. Uh, let's let's start from the bottom and, and go upwards. Uh, so you can you can generate uh, detections uh, using using uh, different systems to generate detections. So in the, that case, that's. Uh, uh, phonemes, right? So you have A and D that 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 makes up the word, and uh, in this case, it deleted the D, uh, which is often the case when 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 you have uh, excuse me, co-articulation. Um, and these are detections, and you can create features in the three ways we described uh, before: existence, expectation, and Levenstein. And then you have features that are defined uh, at the segment level directly, for instance, the duration score uh, that we talked about. And I'll talk about uh, this a little further into detail. Uh, notice that you can also decide uh, to punt. And essentially, if your model or if your feature, if you're not able to create a particular feature for this particular instance, you can actually decide uh, not to produce anything. And that's, that's one of the very convenient things that you have uh, with log linear models, you, you can actually do that. And if you think about you know the research process, a lot of uh, new research has failed in speech recognition because uh, you had to have this generative model that that was able to work and, and create, uh, recreate for every possible you know uh, speech problem, uh, what is possible. And so people people got uh, you know did not have a complete story. Right, and so if you have a particular idea that only works for you know Yahoo, let's say, the word Yahoo, uh, then then you, you you can do it and and decide not to do anything for all other words, and that's fine, right? 
So, so that's a lot of flexibility. And that comes from, uh, from the idea that it's a log-linear model. Uh, and the top line here is another system. Uh, and so you can do system combination. And particularly, if you have an HMM system, uh, st uh, you know, a standard system, you can actually input that to a system. Uh, and it's, it's an important property for us because it means that uh, you can actually reproduce the state-of-the-art system as long as you have it, obviously, uh, which means that you can go no worse uh, than the state-of-the-art system. And again, that was, in practice, uh, a very typical problem with novel approaches that they were never, never able to reach the state-of-the-art system. And so they had to be abandoned. Mm -hmm. Another question. We had a talk here like six months ago about uh, example learning. Yes. <coughs> you know, when you were down with us in Santa Barbara, yeah. you tried to do ro rover. Was yeah, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Is, is this an elegant way of doing rover as well? Does uh, the echo pass that too? Yes. Okay. So, so basically, it's just to kind of like link it to the previous talk, you know, the, you remember I saying that ensemble learning is something that is popping up in different disciplines. And, uh, you know, it just occurred to me that, you know, this is actually doing it, right? Because those could be different representation of, th those are different information sources that could be seen as different uh, kind of like voting agents, right? And CRF will combine them all together. That's right, that's right. So you basically, right, some of the decisions essentially, right, all of these get summed up with some weight uh, to make the decision. Uh, this, is, this is essentially the... Uh, the uh, structural version of, of, of uh, system combination, right? So you can actually go below and not use words, not vote at the word level, but you can decide to word at the phoneme level if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, one of the problems with ensemble learning, at least in sp or, uh, uh, with Rover, with system combination in speech, is that uh, there are practical limitations as to how good the system you combine with. R, right? So if you have a very good system and that you try to combine with a, a poor system, then the very good system will always override the decision most of the time, and it's 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 hard uh, it's hard for you to incorporate that that information. Uh, and so empirically, we found that you know these were of relatively poor quality, and we were still able to get a little bit of gain. Okay, so this, this is how these, these models, maybe, maybe that answers the question, um, how they are related to each other. So the log linear model uh, is, as, as we presented it, is, is a conditional model. So it's, it's not a generative model, and it's a flat model. So you can look at you know, four, these four axes. Our models uh, are the only ones that are segmental. Uh, and so the marker for random fields are just the generative models over graphs, right? So it's structured data. Um, the conditional random fields are not generative, but otherwise they're just like the, the mark of random fields. Uh, the hidden con conditional random fields are especially useful for speech or problems where you don't you have an additional uh, segmentation variable, and so there's a hidden variable. So it's technically not a big deal. You know, all you need to do is to marginalize over all possible uh, versions of the hidden variable as long as it is, it's uh, discrete. Uh, the hidden Markov models are the generative version of the hidden conditional random fields. And it, this is essentially the state of the art uh, in speech. And the conditional uh, random fields are basically like hidden conditional random fields, except that we, we block uh, observations into segments. So segmentation is your, is your hidden variable? Uh, yes. Okay. And with that's a good question. Uh, yes. Because yeah. otherwise it's a CRF, right? Yes. Uh, so, 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 so by, throwing the, by throwing the segmentation in there, you make it both hidden and segmental at the same time. That's right, yeah. Yeah, you can have, basically, if you look at the, the literature in uh, NLP, uh, the segmentation is known to them. Right, so if you do part of speech tagging or whatnot, uh, the segmentation is known to them. You will say something about training this thing, right? Because I don't know much about it, 
Yeah. I was reading that CRF are not complex, but hidden variable CRF, they can become a little bit tricky to train. Um, well, the problem is, is, is convexity, right? So you lose that. So, so yes, you are no longer convex, and so it's, it's, it, it's not known whether you can converge easily to the, to the optimum. In practice, we, we basically ignore it. Uh, uh, and so, so one of the things that you do is, again, you know, with a Bayes rule, you can convert a hidden Markov model into a CRF, right? And with a proper choice of prior, you can flip it over and use exactly the same numbers, right? Uh, which, means that, which means that you can train a hidden Markov model, which is what we do, a maximum likelihood model, and then flip it over into and convert it into a conditional random field and then continue training from there. Uh, yes. Okay. So essentially, what we do is we put the segmentation as the output variable. Maybe it's a li it's a little subtle, but but essentially, uh, you see the segmentation appears here. Q is the segmentation variable, and we sum over all possible ones. Uh, and so this is this is this is how we do it. You you just marginalize over it. OK, so this is another way of looking at things. You have the HMM model, uh, which is the state of the art uh, speech recognition. And you have several levels uh, that you, you, can, you can look at, right? So if we start from the top, uh, you have the concept level, which is uh, you know, Starbucks, uh, this, the, the closest Starbucks near me, right? So I can express that in different ways, like Starbucks coffee, or Starbucks near me, or uh, coffee shop near me. Um, <coughs> that all corresponds to a single business that I want to go to. Uh, below that, you have words, uh, and the words uh, are you know Starbucks is one word, Starbucks coffee is another word, uh, coffee is another word, um, and then you can break down uh, break that down in syllables, and you can further break down in the syllables into phones, and then uh, the phones you can break into three parts. Uh, start, middle, and end, uh, and that we call uh, HMM states. Now, we had applied the Markov assumption here horizontally uh, on, the frame, uh, on a frame basis, uh, on a time basis. Uh, but typically, in an HMM system, this, this chain that goes from down there to up there is almost deterministic. Okay, So if I tell you exactly what the state sequence of HMMs uh, there's, uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping up, up there to the concept level, OK? Um, the flat direct model that we saw in the beginning, uh, they are the most general model, right? So you go directly to the, to the concept level, and you can, use, you can pull information from, from all stages of, uh, all stages, uh, of, uh, of granularity here and use all of these features. And it's the, uh, it has the one that, that has the, m the most hours. However, they're more complex, and they're more computationally, uh, or, or they're, they're simple, but they're more computationally uh, uh, hard. And so uh, the segmental condition on random fields, we just progress uh, with a Markov assumption from word to word. But below words, we can, use, uh, we can still use um, the whole uh, chain of information that's, that's in the in there. And so we believe that this is a good compromise, right? So it could be that just below here at the syllable level is fine. Uh, it's, it's a matter of debate. OK, so um, the segmental conditional random field, that concludes the second part. Uh, they are like uh, flat direct models. Uh, and we, uh, but except that to make it tractable, we break down the problem at the word level, and we apply the Markov assumption to go from word to word. Uh, and it allows uh, seamless integration because there are log linear models. You can use different approaches and uh, integrate them together. And that's that's uh, I'm going to show in the third part of the talk. So uh, any questions?
Okay, so there was a workshop last summer in Baltimore, and this is a premier event in speech recognition. And uh, uh, researchers uh, gather from different parts of, of, the, of the world, and um, they spend uh, six weeks together, uh, try to uh, try to come up with uh, with new approaches, and it's a workshop, and they try to cobble things together and get them to work. And this is uh, this has been sponsored by uh, by the government, for by the NSF. Uh, uh, for many years, and, and many advances in speech recognition uh, came from that. And so we had a workshop there, uh, and uh, we had a, a team of researchers that did uh, many things, and, and uh, many of them are interesting. Uh, I'll just I'll just talk about briefly uh, three of them. But this is just to show you that the idea is that you can. You can have novel ideas, and it's very easy for you to express them into that framework uh, if you have different types of ideas. Uh, so one, um, one I think is is a is a good uh, is a good example. It's a good showcase for what you can do with the segmental conditional random fields. And we had an intern uh, from Stanford. She was very smart, but absolutely no experience in speech. Um, and it's typically very, very hard to contribute anything to a speech recognition system. Uh, it, it typically takes, you know, PhD students several years uh, to ramp up. <coughs> so the idea here is to use duration, uh, and th this is this is a sort of a textbook uh, um, textbook example of where HMMs go wrong. Um, you see that if you use an HMM, you have an exponential, an exponential uh, state distribution, right? Uh, and that, that that comes from the HMM. Essentially, if you have, if you have some probability of, of staying in the same state of, of going to the next state, then uh, every time you see this, you, you want to stay in the same state again, you multiply the probability, right? And so this is why it becomes a simple exponential. If you look at the actual distribution of of uh, of words or phones, they don't look anything like like an exponential distribution, which is what they're supposed to be. And this this has uh, this has been the topic of, of of a lot of irritation coming from the people who are linguistically and phonetically oriented. Uh, and and uh, clearly the model is wrong. Uh, the the question is, you know, does this particular insight help us uh, do recognition a little better? Uh, and and that, that's, that actually was, I, I believe, an open question, uh, right? There are many things that we do wrongly in speech. Uh, and, and the question is, if we do them wrongly equally, then it doesn't. The, the model can be wrong, and it won't hurt. Uh, and so, so the first question to ask is, you know, we, we have a duration. Uh, we have a dur duration of words. and. Uh, when the words are right, or w when the words are correctly recognized or incorrectly recognized, do they look different? Right. So we did that. We collected, uh, we collected the distribution of words. So this is the duration of the word. And this is, uh, we looked at all instances of the word two. Right? Uh, and this is the number of words that uh, occurred at that particular d duration. Right? So of course, the, the the probability of a, of, of a word being, uh, so this you have to divide by 100 to, to be the number of seconds, right? So the probability of, of somebody saying two for, for a second is, is very low, right? Typically, people, people say the word two in, in, a, in a fifth of a second. And what's interesting is that when it was incorrectly recognized, uh, it had a actually different distribution than, than than the true the, the the distribution when it was correctly recognized. So there is some information there, and we'll come back to why we think it's actually this way and not the other way around, which is why the red curve is actually uh, or, or when it's incorrectly recognized, it tends to be shorter rather than longer. Yes. Uh, we're, we're, we're saying that typically the way you speak things is, uh, has some distribution. Mm. And, 
and uh, and and typically, you know, you you we have you, you, there is some distribution. So if you if you speak. Uh, so, so uh, if you speak fast in general, we do we do a normalization so that they they all map to the same thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of uh, uh, unfortunately in English, uh, a lot of function words tend to be short. Uh, not surprisingly, but but un unfortunately for us. It's the duration hypothesized by the recognizer. Ah, okay. So you use the segmentation. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know how different they are, and uh, of course you know that they yeah. can be off. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So, so, so you took the output of the recognizer, and then you saw if it was a mistake order or a correct order on your test set, and then you plotted the curves, and you're showing that the incorrect is faster. Yes. Yes. Uh, but you have an insight there. Yes, and yes. Because usually, like, my intuition there would be it's faster, you have less pain, so you have less information in the, in the utterance, right? I mean, if I come and manipulate the oh, answer okay. for four planes, yeah, I have a higher probability of making a mistake. That was the classical interpretation. So, so, so let, let, let me maybe uh, make this a little. I, 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 think, I think that was related to your question. Maybe I wasn't clear. Uh, which is that the blue one is. It's it's recognize it's all instances that were recognized correctly, Correct. right? Uh, uh, the the red ones is some something that people say, and we said it was two, but it was the wrong thing, right? right. So, so you can speak fast, and you, you'll you'll be there, right? Uh, and so if you speak slowly, uh, uh, and you can speak fast or slowly, whatever. When, whenever it's correct, it's going to be blue, right? When it's incorrect, it's going to be red. So the question is, what is special about when you recognize a word that's not supposed to be there? Uh, it shows up in red. And why, is it, why, why does it tend to be shorter? Yes? So like star star uh, yes. Uh, yes, that's, that's somewhat related to that. Uh, or oh, oh, my, my explanation is somewhat related to that. Of course, we don't know for sure. Yeah. Shorter words were always harder to recognize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because you have less information. That, that's it. That's, that's how uh, we yeah, uh, used to think. And if I take your two curves there and I make an ROC, yes. I basically, sh and you're, you have to assume that the segmentation is not going crazy. So that is a good proxy of the real duration Correct. of the word. And then if you do an ROC, you're basically showing th that, that you know, if a word is shorter, you have a higher probability of making a mistake. Yes. Uh, so, but that's kind of like what they thought was word, the right? classical. This is the same word. I think the same, same word. set of different words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one word. That's so, correct. But I'm sure you have an additional insight, right? But, but that, yeah. yeah. We agree on the starting point, right? Um, yes, but I want to make it clear in the sense that, yes, this is the same word. And so this is the duration of the word, right? And so the confusability, right, the, the point that it's that is short makes it makes it very hard for us to distinguish between these two curves, right? Yeah. Because it's hard to recognize. Uh, and yes, when the when the word, because we want to to be able to recognize correctly when the word is short when it's over there, we try maybe a little too eagerly to recognize it, and that's that's how we get. Okay, so you're saying there is a modeling error right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, yes. Did you uh, ever observe any words that um, map the other way, where uh, the longer duration was incorrect and the shorter duration was correct? Yes. Um, uh, particular word yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Maps incorrectly, but other words yes. The longer utterances. Yes. Map? However, on average, never. On a particular instance, yes. Uh, on average, we looked at you know several several words, and it never happened. Uh, and so, so we have we have some explanation for that. And 
And so the way, the way speech recognition works is that you have an acoustic, acoustic matching part, and you have a language modeling part. And the acoustic modeling part tends to be of, of poor quality, so we rely a lot on uh, the language model to be correct. And the language model is, is just you know, a, a probability of words are, are occurring uh, a priori. And so what happens is that these function words, these very short words, tend to be very probable. Uh, and so in case of doubt, essentially, we, we, we try hard to, to use the probable words because we don't trust the acoustic very much. And so here's, here's an example. The true, uh, the true transcript is called in a place called Tumakakuri, which apparently I think is a, is a place uh, in India somewhere. <laughs> But, and so that, that word is kind of a rare word, okay? So, so the language model really dislikes it. Um, uh, and so the tendency is for us, you know, remember that the acoustics tend to be poor. And so the tendency is for us to actually try to, to break, break that word down into words that are more frequent. However, in, in, in doing that, uh, we, we try to in insert you know small words when there's a long word, and so they don't actually fit. And this is why this is why we try to cram down uh, words uh, in 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 a, in a sp span of time where there isn't much space. And, and this is why we believe that that words you know tend to be shorter uh, owing to that phenomenon. Uh, and so, so the idea is that we can use, uh, so once, once you have that insight, you, you're going to say, okay, I like this word, and I don't like any of these words because their duration uh, is a little shorter, and, and they look a little fishy. So what you want to do is to be able to penalize each of these words individually based on their duration. And, and the framework, of course, allows you to give, to give a score per word. And the way we build that score is as follows. We look at the distribution of the word, uh, and this particular hypothesis instance has uh, 20 frames, which is a fifth of a second. Uh, and we're going to uh, look at the probability when it was a blue one and the probability when it was a red one, an incorrect one. And we ha we're going to add those two scores <coughs> in the linear classifier. And of course, the bigger difference uh, that is, right, uh, the the bigger the difference that is, the more likely that it's a blue one. And of course, when it's very short, it tends to be uh, a negative difference. So we, we will penalize these words that are uh, below that point. Um, and another thing that we did was to look at the top 100 words. Uh, and that's, that's uh, I just kept that slide to, to, to give you an example of, uh, of why you would decide not to produce features for e every possible word. And the reason why you, you focus on the top 100 words is that you have to collect these histograms, and some of the words occur very infrequently. And it's, it's very hard to, to, for you to collect uh, those distributions reliably. And so that's why you, you just... Uh, look at the top 100 words. And um, luckily, uh, the top 100 words account for about half of the probability mass and half of the error mass. And so it's very convenient. You know, you, you just, if you just work on the top 100 words instead of a uh, uh, fifth of a million words, then, uh, then you, uh, you, uh, you still uh, are able to, uh, to look at 50% uh, of the errors. Uh, another refinement of this is to say uh, we have two types of errors, insertion of small little words into a big word or just straight up uh, substitution of one word for another. And so you can build special duration models for these and special duration models for these. Uh, and, and typically, you know, if, if you think about how you would w want to do that in an HMM system, um, it, it's technically possible, uh, just like it's possible to, you know, to, to, to approach pi with, with rational numbers, but it's hard. Um, 
Another phenomenon that you can look at is uh, words have a different duration when they, when they occur uh, before a pause, right? So in that, in that example, you would say, you know, uh, this, this, uh, this motion was approved by the pres president. And then later, President Clinton said, and you would tend to speak the second, the second instance quicker because it's, in, it's within a sentence. And so that's a, uh, that's a, that's a phenomenon in speech that, that, that is present. And you can, you can look at the, the different uh, durations and they indeed uh, look different. Uh, and so you can, again, uh, use this. Uh, any questions on that part? Oop. Uh. You would think, like in India, they don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh. There's a few languages I don't know, and that's the case for a few languages that I don't know. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe that it would be a language dependent, actually. Yeah, yeah. Now they can come up with all those little rules that before we were kind of like, oh, that's a linguist rule. You know, we don't have time, you know, to integrate them. They can come up with a feature. You can train it and see if it works. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So linguists will be very language dependent, right? <laughs> but there are like a bunch of linguists that are always trying to, you know, find the, the next thing to do. So you can basically take the whole linguist and leave it up to the stuff. Yes. That's the hope. How does this feature based universal language? Say it again. How does this feature is based on universal language? <laughs> Right. So there is a good reason to put in, you know, actual language, grammar, and understanding into it. Most everybody understands that. Right. But I found it really uh, remarkable that you only know where those hundred words can occur. You are able to capture a whole lot. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. 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 There is. There, of course. You don't need full, you know, full grammar. Yeah. 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 Um, Yes, uh, there is. Um, now, uh, the, the thing with English is that it has a it has a lot of uh, a lot of words that are in other languages uh, used as an inflection or, or, or a special particle that is, that is used in a different word. So, so it's it's a particular feature of English that there are lots of essentially function words that I could more or less delete half of them and you would still understand, uh, or you you would still be able to. To understand the meaning and get the content, so it, it's arguable also whether whether these hundred words are the right words to focus on. What we've observed is uh, is that when you get rid of these uh, errors with the frequent words, you can get more of the rare words correct, which is which is ultimately what you might be looking for. Right. 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 There is something you know. You, you you can look at speech transcript, and and it has been sort of a, a bit of a disappointment because uh, if you look at the output of a speech recognizer for dictation or something, uh, you will see that some uh, some sentences are just not grammatical and. It, it, on the face of it, it looks like you can actually fix them. Uh, there have been experiments where people actually have pe put uh, humans to the task and say, uh, and ask them to, to correct output. 
and uh, unfortunately they have been uh, unsuccessful. Uh, so, so it's a trade-off. Uh, it seems that you can make things grammatical and you can believe that you understand the, the sentence and, and correct it, uh, but sometimes you get it wrong. Uh, all right, so you know, I, I can go quickly over or just go directly. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, okay. Um, so, so the next uh, the next team was uh, working on uh, what we call template based features. So this this old approach uh, from the seventies uh, that is a very direct approach. Uh, essentially, uh, <coughs> the idea is to have templates of sounds and how they sound like and just match them directly. And the reason why people come back to these approaches uh, is that nowadays you have a lot more data uh, and the best classifier you can build actually, uh, which, which re reaches the, uh, twice the base error, is a, is a, is a nearest neighbor, uh, nearest neighbor uh, approach, which means that if you have lots of data, you just remember uh, every single example that you've seen. And uh, the best classifier you can build is basically to look at uh, the closest example in your training database uh, and see uh, how close uh, it is. Like there is theoretic, because that's always the yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there, there is yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you can look at the capacity of the model, right? And any, any model of finite size will have a finite capacity. Okay. And so. For some dimensionality, you get too many right. features. And right. The features add noise to some classes, but not add noise to other classes. Right. Uh, and so essentially, yes, well, so, so it's, it's all work from the, from the 70s, but basically you reach twice. If you have a large K in a KNN, um, then you, you reach, you reach uh, twice, twice the base error. Twice the what? The base error, which, which is the smallest error you can, you can get. Uh, so they generalize? Uh, so they, they don't generalize very well, but if you have an awful lot of data, they will do awful, awfully well, uh, right? And so if you, if you have a model of finite size, it, eventually it will be, you, you will be hurt by, by, by something, right? You, you, can, you can continue increasing, increasing the model size, but as long as you have, you have chosen your model in a particular family, you are restricted to this family, however good that is, uh, and, and you cannot have you know, unless unless the, mo the the samples are generated synthetically, uh, you will always have these these exceptions. Um, oh, okay, the pictures. Okay, so he here's a depiction. Oh, I think the pictures didn't come come out right, but basically this is supposed to extend here, and you're supposed to see uh, uh, waveforms here. Uh, and, and basically, this is how it works. Uh, you, have, you have some input signal that has some shape, and you want to, uh, you want to select templates from, uh, from a database of templates, and you, you pick them from the database. Oop. You pick them from the database, and then you recreate uh, a waveform by pasting samples, coupling samples together from your database of sounds, and, uh, and match it. This is the basic principle. Uh, each each of these, you know, each of these snippets, uh, you try to find an example in the database that looks as close as, as, as you can to this. Uh, well, the, it's dynamic time warping, so so oh, you so do. It, 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 it yeah, yes, yes. Um, but they tend to be, so they operated at the phone level, which, which tends to be relatively small. So they tend to be not very aggressive in the, in the DTW. R right. They so, so not too much things that are too different in length, right? Right. So there's this part, and also uh, the phones tend to be really small but in and of themselves. So the variability within a phone tends to be relatively small. Mm. But you could. Uh, you could just decide that you, you would want a different model for every single duration. 
that's fine. And, and then the matching becomes a lot easier. Um, and so this is how it works. You know, you have you have all possible hypotheses. You break them down into uh, phones. You do the matching of the phone itself, uh, and then you add up those scores, and you get uh, you get the final score. Uh, it's, it's not exactly crucial that you understand this, but it's ju just to give you a flavor of uh, of what it is. Uh, and what you can do. So th th this approach, when it was in the 70s, was just, was just matching, matching all of these phones one by one. Right? And what we've added here is that because you have a log linear framework, you can actually integrate more a richer set of information that you can uh, put in the matching. Uh, so for instance, you can decide uh, uh, in the matching that y you want to have a, a better weight when both when all snippets for the same word come from the same original word in the database, right? So you try, you know, instead of, let's say you have a, a Starbucks, uh, everything comes from an instance of Starbucks. That's better than to say, you know, half of the words come from uh, Star Wars and the other half come from uh, Bucks, right? So, so that's that's more information that you can integrate into the matching, and that's that's the flexibility of the log linear models. Yes. Maybe I know Canon is not parametric. Yeah. And doing sample size charts is parametric. Has it ever? It sounds like you were taking into account the sample size increases were more confident in this. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't remember, uh, unfortunately. I can get back to you on that if you. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm still a little confused about things in the internet. You start your samples in the middle of a the phone M, for example. Yes. How, how are you detecting the phase? Or is that where you started at the beginning, or the middle, or somewhere? That yes. Um, so, so, so the idea is that from the, we have an initial hypothesis of where the phoneme boundaries are, right? So we chop up a word into uh, several phones, right? Uh, yeah, that's the part I don't understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it comes out naturally out of the HMM system. Uh, so, so remember, remember we said that we try all possible segmentations. Uh, to, to generate a word hypothesis, a sequence, word sequence hypothesis, we try all possible combination of words, and we try notionally all possible combination of time boundaries that are associated to them. But we also try all possible combinations of phone boundaries that are associated to those. So as we, do, as we, as we run this, this program, we will get uh, what the model, the model believes is uh, the best uh, phone segmentation. Uh, so it, it comes out of the, of the HMM because we tried them all, and, we and there's one that we believe, according to the model, is the most likely. Uh, OK. And then there's the third approach, just, just to give you a flavor of, of you know, how, how different you can do things, differently you can do things. Um, and so this, this idea is to, is to have uh, Windows-based acoustic models where we say we, we have a waveform and we, tr we, have, we have just a model for one word. And we slide, it's, it's just a detection to see whether the word V is present in a waveform. We, so we just slide, slide, the, slide the window and every now and then we're going to say, okay, this, this corresponds to a word. And y you can use that. Uh, Essentially, this is uh, this is uh, motivated by the work that you uh, you see in uh, in other fields, where uh, they're called spectrotemporal receptive fields. So basically, what happens is that uh, they essentially take ferrets and, and they cut them, uh, and they see uh, what are the activations in the uh, 
within the brains uh, uh, are happening. And, and you see uh, patterns of uh, spectral and temporal uh, uh, spectral and temporal patterns that activate uh, different parts of the of the brain, and, and so this is an attempt to uh, to recreate uh, that, but with with uh, generic features. Uh, and, and so this is how it works. You just slide the window, and every now and then you'll see you'll see a bump in in uh, in uh, the activation of the spectrotemporal receptive film. Uh, Another idea is to use these activations in a, in a, in a process model, right? So, so you, see, uh, you, see, you see the phonemes here, and, and each of them has, you know, has a sliding window that, that windows through, and you see more activations. So the more activations you see, the more, uh, the more likely the phone is actually around this. And so you can, you can look at these patterns. Uh, and and uh, uh, and see what you can do, and this is a very lightweight approach that that can be used in a, in different contexts. For instance, uh, this is very useful for the government, uh, where they want to spot on large amounts of audio, they want to spot keywords, uh, and they want to do, to do it very quickly. Uh, okay, so that concludes our talk. Basically. Uh, these are results um, it's not essential for you to to really uh, understand them but we, we, we had some improvement uh, which by a speech standard is, is considered to be uh, to be very good um, um, essentially you know we, we, we've shown that the approach tends to work uh, and so uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, uh, segmental conditional random fields are a framework that, are, that is useful for integrating uh, uh, different features. And uh, we've shown an improvement. You'll have to trust me on that. We'll show a, a good improvement on broadcast noise and, and uh, competitive state-of-the-art speech system. And we've integrated uh, several approaches to prove the concept. All right. Thank you. So, um, if you would like to stay and ask questions. Mm -hmm.